Okay, hi. <coughs> now comes the visuals. So I'm here because uh, I'm working at the ZKM uh, since 20 years now in the field of media art, uh, creation of artworks in, uh, uh, you mentioned, you said visuals, but uh, these are the visuals for interactive installations, for uh, concerts, for uh, operas, for any kind of uh, performative image. Not for movies, not a pre-recorded uh, uh, image, <laughs> um, but uh, for interactive images. So I joined the ZKM in the year 1996. <clears throat> and uh, at that time, Jeffrey Shaw uh, was the head of the Institute for Visual Media. And he's uh, one of the media art pioneers. Um, his topic, uh, he was extremely interested in the creation of, uh, immersi uh, of immersive display environments. Uh, so he was creating them, not just using them. And I was coming from the software field. I was interested in uh, how uh, one can create uh, graphics which uh, uh, are different than other ones. So I'm interested in how we perceive the world and uh, uh, depending on how you create the graphics, if you're using video or if you're using uh, computer uh, generated graphics, you perceive the world differently and our perception is uh, the channel which determines on uh, uh, determines our conception of the world. So one, one, one uh, point which influences on how we uh, uh, think the world is of our understanding of the world. So he was creating environments, I was creating uh, software for dealing with uh, both of us with content and it was a perfect symbi symbiosis. Meanwhile I created 50 works of uh, 50 pieces by my own and supported uh, a lot of other ones. So I mentioned uh, I joined the ZKM in the 90s. In the 90s, um, <coughs> there has been already one hype of virtual reality. Um, this image is uh, kind of emblematic. It shows uh, an HMD developed at NASA by Scott Fisher et al. And um, uh, you see on this image this head-mounted display with, which covers completely your field of view, but also the, uh, the data glove, uh, which the NASA commissioned to VPL, the company of, uh, I hope I pronounce them correctly, uh, Jaron Lanier, um, Jaron Lanier. And uh, so you had already both uh, uh, aspects of virtual reality, which is now, uh, or, or let's say which we know as the aspects of virtual reality, which is uh, the visual. <clears throat> um, you see he, he has headphones, audio, and interaction. So the data glove is for uh, interaction. But of course the <coughs> uh, virtual reality began not at that point, so it's, it's a smooth development. And uh, the first uh, technically working head-mounted display was developed by Morten Heilig which uh, what, what most of you probably know. In 1960, he already patented this uh, head-mounted display with uh, two TV screens in it. And he could, uh, of course, not show interactive graphics, but uh, stereoscopic video images. So Morten Heilig is often referred to as uh, being the father of virtual reality because he built one uh, extremely highly developed uh, machine at that time. In 1957, he developed the Sensorama, and the Sensorama is a uh, full perception machine. Um, you had a stereoscopic movie. Actually, it, you, you saw a motorcycle drive in San Francisco. Um, recorded with a stereo camera. You had stereo sound. You also had vibration, so tactile feedback. Um, uh, you had uh, wind. There was a little ventilation system in there. And don't ask me how he did do that. Um, he also, you had also smell in there. Uh, so he created the first instance, working instance. Uh, and with working, I mean uh, these machines. He placed them in pubs. So he had five instances of this build. He placed them in pubs. Pubs, you could insert a coin, and then you got the experience. So it was uh, really a working thing. Um, uh, but this full um, all senses addressing machine, or, or this concept, was formulated later by Ivan Sutherland uh, in a paper in 1965. Uh, the paper was called The Ultimate Display. And there he describes this, uh, everything is addressed, and even um, 
uh, if something is displayed, it should behave as if it would be part of uh, the real reality. That means uh, a chair displayed in such a room would be a good would be good enough to sit on. Huh? So not just a little bit uh, tactile feedback, but everything in, uh, in reality is, uh, is simulated. He also invented uh, one see-through head-mounted display, the so-called Sword of Democles. The video is running, yes, um, <coughs> because uh, it was a very heavy machinery which was hanging from the ceiling. And uh, they always, uh, uh, his people were always fearing that uh, it breaks once. So, uh, um, these were already the uh, components um, uh, of immersive display environments. And uh, the HMD is a nice thing, but uh, you have it in front of your head, you cannot see through. Uh, and in the 90s, uh, it was not very successful because um, <clears throat> if you want to use that, uh, uh, or it was not successful with uh, artists, media artists, because if you want to use that, um, uh, you, you uh, have to deal with a lot of uh, difficulties, which is, uh, are the same difficulties which are there at the moment if you are using HTC Vive or Oculus, for example. Um, you have the cabling, it's a single user experience. Uh, uh, if you have trackers, for example, with the controllers, you need somebody who helps you, so uh, there's a personal uh, uh, effort. You have to pay people for helping uh, the audience. And there's a hygienic, hygienic problem. No? So you have to deal with the sweat, sweat of the people and so on. So in the 90s, uh, 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 immersive environment installed in the space were much uh, more successful. And one of these environments is the cave, automatical, uh, cave automatic virtual environment. The cave developed in Chicago at the EVL. And it's a uh, cube with, at that time, four projection screens on the front, on the bottom, left and right, projected with stereoscopic imagery. So there was uh, a head tracking system, so one person, one uh, uh, of the audience could wear a head tracker and then the, the stereoscopic uh, projection uh, Frustum was generated perfectly for his viewing position and the other audience still saw something in 3D but uh, a little bit distorted. So Jeffrey got the commission to do a work for such an environment from the ICC Intercommunication Center in Tokyo in 97. At that time I just joined the ZKM so uh, finally it figured out that we did do that together and he uh, set a wooden puppet as the user interface for the environment. So he thought uh, a puppet is uh, closer to a human than a mouse. Uh, so, and he uh, asked himself what happens if the people are dealing with something which is very human-like. Uh, so uh, that was set and then we created, then we created uh, seven different graphical environments for this cave. And we just uh, got rid of one of the problems right now in virtual reality, which is you have a limited space, but you want to move somewhere else. So how do you deal with that? Um, there's no uh, good solution for that now, which uh, doesn't make you motion sick. At that time, we simply created environments which were self-contained. So these were non-navigational environments. So our question was, how can you create space with visuals? So if you switch the projection screens off, there's nothing. That means you are the one who is creating the space. And we were asking ourselves, what kind of methods are there for creating the space? In this environment, for example, there are uh, extruding uh, platonic objects which come out of nothing, and there are uh, uh, taking over the space. So Jeffrey <coughs> um, developed uh, the Eve Dome which is uh, an inflatable dome. The Eve dome stands, Eve stands for extended virtual environment. Inflatable dome with uh, a, uh, a pen and tilt head in the middle. So here again, one user has a tracking device on his head, so attached to uh, earphones. And uh, depending on where he is looking, um, uh, the uh, imagery was projected to. So this was not an head-mounted display. 
but it was some kind of head linked display. So, and you had uh, a strong feeling of that the image is connected to you. So, differently than uh, having a full surround environment uh, where the image is there, here you had the feeling that you are uh, in responsibility of the image. So, the other paradigm, full uh, surround image imagery, is that here. Oh, <coughs> wrong title, not Eve Dome. It's, room, it's a work room with a view made for the Skoda Pavilion at the Autostadt, uh, VW Autostadt in Wolfsburg. And there we made a, uh, a, a full dome interactive experience with a touch screen which is uh, mounted in the middle. It's rotatable and on the top of the, of the column there's a little camera. And the camera image is displayed in the, uh, in the screen. And on top of uh, this camera image, we put uh, icons which, uh, with which you could interact with. That means you interacted with the camera image, and then um, uh, 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 you did do something in the environment. So the content is uh, Czech related. It was, uh, the, the piece was commissioned by uh, a Czech company. And they just wanted to show culture, so we showed different aspects of uh, Czech culture, architecture, writings, literature, uh, visual art, and so on. So we created also, uh, also uh, initiated by Jeffrey, our own uh, panorama uh, developments. Um, the panorama technology includes uh, uh, meanwhile, three screens, a 10-meter screen, an 8-meter screen, and a 6-meter screen, uh, plus software which allows you to drive the panorama. It's a plug-in software which allows you to uh, uh, write your own uh, uh, code for doing very specific and interactive stuff. And um, <clears throat> we created around 20 works with that over the last 10 years. Um, and one of the works is the installation yeah, cloud browsing. is cloud browsing, which you can see at the entrance of the ZKM. If you enter the ZKM right uh, on the right side, there is a uh, cylindrical space with an uh, installed uh, six meter panorama screen. And there you can see this application. And this application is a information retrieval system, a visual recommendation system. Um, you can browse Wikipedia with that uh, installation. You're surrounded by hundreds of images, around 400 images at a time. And if you click on a image, or each image refers to a Wikipedia article. If you click on an image, then there's a browser also displayed on the screen. Uh, the browser shows uh, the related article. And in the background, um, the system searches for related articles on Wikipedia. Uh, uh, downloads uh, images from the related articles with check copyrights so that we don't do anything, show anything which we are not supposed to do. And um, then these images appear beside the, uh, the Wikipedia page. So we also created our um, own uh, image acquisition system, so a, a spherical camera. Uh, and did do some did do some stuff with it. So you see, we did a helicopter shoot, um, uh, which was a flight over the Italian Dolomites, the mountain view, uh, uh, for an installation of a French director and media artist Jean Michel Bruyer. So actually, I was uh, joining the ZGM when I wrote a certain software, uh, Xfrog. It's called Xfrog. It's called Xfrog. It's a generative software and. Uh, what it does do, it uh, offers you, uh, in, in terms of little icons, um, uh, little algorithms. It's a pr procedural modeler, and you compose uh, uh, your model by uh, building a hierarchy of, uh, of algorithms. Uh, so behind each icon, there's a certain, a certain principle of uh, how uh, uh, nature does do something. <laughs> So there are icons for, it's, it's, I'm a little bit complicated right now. So there's an icon for creating leaves, for example. There's an icon for creating uh, little stems. There's an icon for arranging other icons 
um, uh, uh, with the proportion of the golden section on a sphere, a half sphere, on a plane or whatever. And if you begin to uh, combine, to link these icons, then you cre uh, can create something extremely complex. So even something which looks like uh, natural environments. So I made this actually for doing a certain installation, which is called Sonomorphis. Sonomorphis is a uh, uh, genetic um, installation where you have a user interface which consists of, out of buttons and sliders. With a button, you can choose operations on the actual model which are modifying, which are mutating, and then the system generates several instances of, uh, uh, of the object which is in front of you, and you can choose one of, out of uh, the different variations. And then the model, which is displayed in stereo, in uh, visually in 3D, and in terms of audio, uh, quadraphonic with two speakers in front of you and two speakers behind you, it's displayed, or the, the additional elements are growing out of the object which you see in front of you. So we planned the whole thing as a uh, audiovisual instrument. Uh, so with a little knowledge on that, you should be able to create uh, extremely interesting visuals and sound. In that was 98, nearly 20 years ago. So 10 years ago, we did do an implementation for a 180 degree stereoscopic uh, panorama screen within the audio dome, which Marie um, introduced in the talk uh, earlier. Um, so uh, the objects which you see somewhere are having also related sounds, which are creating, uh, created also procedurally, procedurally with uh, uh, physical simulation. And where you see the objects, you also hear the sound distributed by this uh, 42 speaker sound environment. So later, or oh, now instances or, or examples for uh, augmented reality, because uh, some years ago, augmented reality became available via mobile AR. And uh, this allows one to, as an artist, to address also people which are not coming to the museum, and that was, uh, for me, especially interesting, um, to address other kind of audiences. And uh, this actually is also one thing why the uh, uh, HMDs, the Oculus Rift, and the HTC is now uh, interesting, because they are giving a standard environment, which everybody, in theory, can have at home. Every museum can buy it, and you just give them executables, and then they can execute it. So you could, in theory, distribute your, uh, not just in theory, your uh, artworks via Steam, huh? and then address everybody at home, because it's a standard environment. So some years ago, we uh, began to um, develop with augmented reality, and uh, uh, this is the work of Evelyn Ribaschek. Evelyn Ribaschek, um, is uh, originally a uh, scenographist. She makes scenography. And uh, this work is in a bunker uh, in Munich. Um, you apply for the work. Uh, you get a ticket for half an hour, and you are the only one who is going into the bunker. You are getting in, uh, uh, a smartphone uh, with uh, uh, headphones, and the headphones uh, uh, let the audio through from the environment. The environment is also emitting audio, so there are speakers in the uh, <coughs> in the walls, in boxes, in tables, and so on. So the environment already has its audio, and this audio is uh, 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 and and uh, there's audio added from the uh, from the phone. So the people know know only that they have to point with the phone. Uh, on these uh, augmented reality markers, on these squares, and then they're getting additional, this is maximum audio, and then they're getting a little show. Uh, so uh, the story is that there's not really a story, but there's uh, a kind of uh, 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 social construction behind it. Uh, so it's some kind of uh, 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 clinic, yes, it's, uh, Asylum, some kind of asylum, 
uh, of the future or the past. It's very uh, 70s like the whole environment and you're getting little pieces of a story. You're seeing advertising videos uh, for making you, uh, uh, for extending your lifetime, um, for making uh, uh, your life better and so on. So you go in, you don't get a full story, but you get glimpses of what is there and it's extremely, it's extremely uh, fascinating. There was one, there was one um, uh, moment in there which fascinated me extremely, which is the bath here. You go in and there's a particular smell so that smell uh, evoked something very deep in me. So and I asked her uh, what the smell was and she said uh, she used for the, she just wanted to have uh, a pink liquid in there and she, she used a certain washing um, liquid for that. Ich weiß nicht, das war Persil oder so, uh, which my mother was using when I was young. Uh, so, and then it came to me again that uh, working with smell can be extremely efficient. So, uh, based on that experience, we did do here with Ludger uh, and uh, some others here, we did do an uh, augmented reality piece for the city. So, for 300 days, we placed markers in the city. Uh, people could download an app from the App Store and then go to these locations and get little augmented reality uh, experiences. Here you see some examples of uh, what the people could see. So there were masks at column, at a column at the spring which began to talk. Um, there were, uh, uh, and other things. <clears throat> so it looked like that here. Karl Einstein. Karl Einstein is an art historian he was uh, living in Karlsruhe and he was writing about Karlsruhe that it's the most boring city uh, in the world <laughs> and after one uh, night in the pub he lies on floor on the floor and then he talks a little bit about Karlsruhe so the whole app was about people once living in Karlsruhe and we uh, uh, made research on their biography and uh, took out a certain aspect of their biography and uh, used that aspect as a little drama which could be uh, uh, totally metaphoric uh, there were also some uh, infographics uh, uh, for a woman uh, which dealt with uh, uh, which made paintings out of mathematical drawings, uh, out of graphs. So, and we did do some uh, real shootings and so on. This was uh, made in collaboration with the uh, theatre, with the State Theatre in Karlsruhe and the SVR, Hörspielstudio, you know, with the local radio station. And the quality was really high content. Traditionelle Leichtfertigkeit zugiger Vormittage. So, <clears throat> In the last time I'm dealing with uh, these devices which are already mentioned, HTTC Vive and so on, simply because uh, it's very easy to distribute. So I want to reach more people than just the people who are coming into, uh, uh, into the museum. And um, <clears throat> uh, you have to deal with drawbacks. Actually, uh, the resolution, the visual quality of that is not better. Uh, than of the devices in the in the 90s, oh, so it's nearly the same um, uh, quality. So I calculated in the last week the effective visible resolution of the HTTC Vive, which is around 800 pixels horizontally per eye. And uh, then it came to my mind that uh, in the 90s I read a paper about uh, perception in virtual real reality, and it said that a doctor would say you are blind if you could see only that resolution. <laughs> huh? So in fact, um, uh, this device makes you blind. <laughs> so, and I was also totally disappointed when I made a port of the Panorama software for HTTC Vive. So I thought um, for distributed works for the Panorama, um, I could simulate a Panorama. And uh, when, I, when everything was implemented, I saw it on the screen, the result I put on the helmet, and uh, then I thought, no, no. So I saw uh, cloud browsing and I couldn't read the text at all. Uh, so I had to go so close to the screen 
to be able to read the text. So if you want to do any information retrieval, information dis visualization application, don't do it, use the Vive. Use a panorama or, or whatever. And I'm coming to the end now. Uh, the thing which I'm working on uh, at the moment is um, addressing, addressing uh, yourself. So. Um, the visual quality is not very good, but uh, where it's very good is uh, your feeling of being inside the visual environment. And that is due to the perfect tracking. So the real advance is not uh, that the displays are better or, or something like that. It's the tracking. It's solely the tracking. So if you move the head, then the image follows you uh, uh, so perfectly that you have the feeling you are totally in. But the question is, uh, what is you? Because if you're looking down, you see that you're not there. Uh, and that create this irritation if you're hit by bullets, for example, nothing happens. Uh, there's no gravity of objects in the virtual world. So um, there's uh, still this question of uh, what is you within the virtual world? And that was, is what I'm addressing with uh, a current installation, which will be showed in March. So there the user will um, uh, uh, put on a helmet and uh, the virtual world uh, does, is showing a recreation of the real space where he is in with a virtual wall. And when he crosses the wall, he uh, changes uh, the kind of representation of the virtual world. So it's one times modeled. It's uh, recreated with, with photogrammetry. It's, uh, I'm using Stereolab's uh, stereoscopic camera, which will be attached to the Vive. So you see, see a stereoscopic video with a depth representation, which blends over the uh, virtual objects, which I'm placing in the environment. And you see yourself in the virtual environment, which is uh, a recreation of yourself with the Kinect, for example, also with the uh, Stereolab's device. And I'm putting a 180 degree camera, dome camera, half sphere camera on, uh, on, 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 on the wall. So you see yourself also uh, with this kind of uh, representation. So it's playing with representations of your own. So, and if you wanna see uh, a representation of yourself via the Kinect, you can enter the uh, exhibition directly at the entrance on the left side. Uh, that's also my, my installation. Uh, enjoy it and thank you for the attention. So, thank you very much for this very interesting talk, thank this you. overview and perspective. Are there any questions? I'm sure that you have some questions. Mm -hmm. Marie Christi. I have a question. Um, <coughs> I had a very interesting experience a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question. Uh, I had a very interesting experience a few weeks ago on VR chat. This is a application that you can download and then you can really meet people in the VR. So you could choose an avatar and then you have a body and you experience spaces. You can enter um, doors that are open, then you are in a bar or you are in a gallery space and you can see artworks there. And um, yeah, I was wondering if there are um, already art projects out there, if you know art projects um, that um, focus on the social aspect um, of VR and um, also your opinion about this. Is this something that could be the future or is the future rather um, something more related to augmented reality or mixed reality or Microsoft HoloLens this direction? Yeah, what's, what's your opinion on that? Uh, does it have a future? So Facebook counts on that as being the future of uh, virtual reality, the future of people uh, are not phoning anymore, not Skyping anymore, but they will uh, meet in virtual reality. And there are several uh, social plat platforms out there. Uh, Allspace VR, for example, is I think recently bought by Microsoft. This is also a platform where you can go in, have an avatar, play with other people and so on. So there are big companies which are betting on this is the next big thing. Uh, um, I personally don't know of any, uh, uh, of any artistic application of that, no? but uh, I'm, yeah, I don't know of any. But uh, I personally think that uh, even though VR 
the current state is still not the thing, uh, in 10 years, 15 years, it will be. And then everybody will be having a mixed reality headset, which uh, can blend between reality and virtuality with a button or whatever. No? You could say, shut down and show me just virtual stuff, and this will be normal. So I would like to thank Bernd. He can ask a last question, but I would like to ask Daniela de Paulis to set up for her talk. Yeah, she's here. So if you have any further question to Bernd, it's the time to ask your question. Yes, please. Now. Now. <laughs> um, well, uh, of course, uh, I don't know if that's working. Uh, about the sound um, part. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you say that the, the 800 pixel, sort of the, this very low resolution, but, but sound has, has made some more developments since the 90s uh, with real-time uh, yes. first-order ambisonic rendering and so on with the head tracking. Yes. Yes. Um, and I wondered if, uh, I guess you know something about Zach Lieberman's work. Um, he's doing Open Frameworks library yeah. for AR. Yeah. Yeah. And he posts every day something on Twitter. Uh -huh. And he posted something that was fascinating for me and it w went quite viral. But it was a, an AR idea that where he could just uh, spread a sound through the space and it would leave a visual trace. And then he could move the phone back through the sound and it would granulate spatially with the AR. And it's the only thing I've seen that um, was that impressive. Uh, it wasn't just trying to do. Uh, head tracking situated sound it was trying to do a new type of in audio interface and I wanted to ask if you had uh, come across more advances in, in AR sound like that. More advances in AR sound? Um, no. No, okay. Very short so, it, so it's still very so much. So I, I just know the, or let, let's say, uh, tr uh, have a trivial understanding because I'm a visual guy from yeah. head rate transfer functions and so on. But, uh, 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 actually, uh, people report more uh, about the visual uh, than about the audio. Uh, there are some reports about tactile, uh, uh, tactile devices, which are also very interesting. Uh, some devices address uh, that you cannot uh, walk, so walking uh, devices. Uh, a few smelling devices no, that happens from time to time. Uh, so 10 years ago, there was already a smell device on the market. You could buy it with five different smells. Um, but most of it is addressing the visuals. And uh, I also don't understand it uh, because uh, 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 the audio is totally underestimated um, by society. Uh, and I don't know why. I have no idea. I just can confirm there's a huge gap to close because the technology is there since a long time. Um, it's just in between visual and audio, there is still not a lot of talking in between. I try which, to talk. Which has to be changed. Okay, so thank you very much, Bernd. Um.